powerlessness you feel because you feel so crushed by the corporate structure. You can believe your body will be cast aside and you will rise. Alienation will be ameliorated by this merger with all the other believers. And in a corporate structure that destroys eros the way it does, and, and I, I don't mean strict, strictly sexual eros, I mean the ability to have freedom in the world. When that happens, you get a catastrophe of people feeling powerlessness, a catastrophe of people feeling alienation, and, a, and the imagination that once connected to the landscape, connected to those snap beams, becomes distorted into a death urge. And that death urge says we instantly have to leave our body, even if it means the destruction of the world. Well, look around you. Look at the degraded landscape that corporatism has given us. Look at the way we all feel atomized, alienated, powerlessness. No wonder we identify, well, fundamentalists identify with Terry Schiavo, laying there on a bed, stuck, powerlessness, a, an inhuman system plugged into it. No matter, no wonder they want her to rise from the dead like Jesus. Because their own eros, their own life, they feel so crushed, as we all do. You see the culture of SUVs out there? It's about a compensation for powerlessness. We sit over the traffic, we feel a moment that we don't feel so powerlessness, mm -hmm. and there, hence, the church's muscular Jesus. You have Mel Gibson having that snuff film where Jesus endured lots of punishment because we feel like we're constantly being punished, powerless. I mean, to people that have no power in the life, the symbol of the cross is very powerful. And it does not come from logic. It comes from a feeling of their own life of being able, unable to move, unable to live, unable to express themselves. And so when you sit in a mega church and you have the semblance of a community in a landscape that has no community, that has no public square, that has no place to express itself, that imagination is thwarted at every turn, the imagination becomes this concretized thing that becomes a death urge into the world because at least violence is connection. So if you can't have your hand on my shoulder, you have your hands around my throat. And in that moment, we are connected. And as I said, I approach this different from my background in poetry. I try to listen to what people are saying because we don't approach things logically. The Greeks got at this, for example, with the Bacchus, with the idea of a logical king, Pentheus, who would not recognize the god of the grape, the god of unreason, Dionysus, and he ends up literally handed his head by his wife and his sister. Well, that's why when we use logic against Christians and fundamentalists, we keep getting handed our head in every election <laughs> because we're not dealing with logic here. We're dealing with a fantasy of escape. We're dealing with a fantasy of Americans medicating themselves by being, by being overweight, by eating fast food. And they, this fantasy of the rapture means I'm even leaving my own despisable body, as I said a minute ago. Now, the rapture, according to clothes are going to fall away. People are going to rise up in the air. I mean, think of that metaphor. The clothes fall off. I don't have to have this false self, to use Artie Lang's term, that I put on in everyday life. The falseness that I have to feel to be really clean and good for Jesus every day. That even falls away. And all that falls away and you rise heavenward. All these naked, overweight people, it's going to look like an endless tape, where, <laughs> tape loop. <laughs> for a fat fetish is pornography. But, see, we can debunk this rationally. We can laugh at it. It's too easy. <laughs> One of the ways that we on the left can do this is we can, deal it, we can deal with it with humor because we know how toxic and dangerous it is. But if we come from a voice of compassion with the people I grew up around, 
My wife was born in a swamp, literally in a sharecropper shack. And you try to take religion away from her people, they're going to explain to you things differently with the weaponry they have around the house. <laughs> you know? Because logic doesn't come into it as it doesn't do with any of us. Because if we think of our earliest yearnings, what the Greeks call pathos, our, that feeling you got when we were all young, maybe you saw the ocean for the first time. Maybe you saw a ship sail over the known horizon. That feeling of the endless bounty and possibility of your life, when that is broken from the time you were young, you are going to yearn for the infinity that you spoke about. And that's going to be a compens compensatory myth that is going to have not anything to do with in the extant world in reason, but with an ability of yourself to express yourself freely and to move towards freedom. Now, I think that we have to approach this situation when we talk, like, I, I've been here at this conference, and people in the town have been approaching me and go, what are those people up to? <laughs> now, having grown up in Appalachia myself, there's, there's a different a difference in Appalachia where my wife grew up a flatlander in the lowlands of South Carolina. There's a real difference in mountain people. They will at least investigate you. <laughs> and when we've talked about, when I've approached it and said, this is about a very small group of people controlling all our lives. And to use the words that Pogo used in the 50s, those that has gets. And th that we feel in our lives, we have no control over it no matter what we do with two political parties that are really the same thing. Then they start responding from their own sense of frustration and powerlessness. But if we immediately start debunking what they have hold sacred without building alliances, then we've destroyed everything. So what I would have to urge is to come from the aspect of when you're dealing with fundamentalists, actually leave the house, actually speak to them, have dinner with them, and then very slowly find out what you have in common rather than what polarizes and alienates. Because in this corporatized culture where we all are feeling that alienation every moment of our lives, that's why we spend so much time online, that's why we come to these things, that's what we yearn for. Let's try to come from those, and that's the best I can suggest. Thank you. Thank you. Of investigating uh, you uh, and asking about uh, what we're doing here at the conference, the Global Town People, we have a new department of security and terrorism here on campus. It's something that has just come about. And uh, they, I am told, they went to conference services here at Radford University and said, what is this you're building here? What is? What are you bringing to this campus? <laughs> and, uh, and of course, conference services said, well, just ask Dr. Martin. We'll explain it to you. <laughs> <laughs> they never asked me. <laughs> they, they didn't want to hear it. Um, so anyway, uh, I thought we had uh, five marvelous presentations, and I, I'm sure you have a lot of questions and so on. Roger? Um, can we pause for a second while we figure out how we can how we can hear them. Uh, can I carry this uh, mic around? Or? Uh, you can, and, and I'll put this mic on to their desk. Okay. Uh, yeah. Think you're In fact, up. This mic yeah, up. maybe it would be best to come down yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, that'd be good. Good idea. Down as far as... Uh,
of the uh, control system to deny the importance of the community. To say ultimately they're going to escape out of this, no matter how much they destroy the community, ultimately they've got an exit. Back here. But the community in turn is dealing with this alienated environment that the control system has created for it. And as Phil just pointed out, um, the community finds comfort in this sense of the smashing together of souls that somehow they'll all be united. <laughs> Not in the specific ways that families and communities actually work together to build the, the fabric of life, but all in this one big cosmic ejaculation. Cosmic, yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 Very good. Really important subject on a practical level. I discovered that uh, when I got involved with the World Federalist, I discovered that Armageddon was a big deal and that it uh, formed an obstacle. People, uh, I happen to believe that we ought to be recruiting the religious community to world peace. And uh, I get a little upset when Air America and some of the left uh, makes fun of the religious community rather than finding common ground. So that's a comment. Um, what I would like to ask uh, the, the panel to comment on is ways we can approach the religious community. Uh, there's a panic sets in when they find out that there might actually be a way to world peace, that we might not have to have Armageddon. Mm -hmm. There's a panic that sets in psychologically that if they start working with us for world peace and we skip Armageddon, that they're betraying uh, their religious Christian faith. And it's very real. I've had some, some of my family's fundamentalists. In fact, I had a great grandfather who translated the Bible into poetry. So that's my question to you. And this t-shirt is my psychologist's method to start penetrating the religious community. It says, disarm again, <laughs> to start a dialogue. And it works uh, to break through this uh, psychological barrier of uh, if we actually get world peace and skip death and destruction, that uh, we're betraying uh, the end times. So that's my uh, question to, to all of you. And, and one thing I found effective is to talk about uh, we're at the crossroads. Is Jesus going to be the uh, prince of death, meaning Armageddon, wipe it out, Israel, goodbye, or is Jesus going to be the Prince of Peace and we get an Earth Federation? That ended up with speech, sorry. Thank you, Gregory. Who's going to answer? Who wants to answer? I think the risks are very real here because even the President of the United States has given indication that he believes in end times and the apocalyptic view and maybe seeking to precipitate the end of the world in his duration as President of the United States. There are lots of indications, for example, of the administration's intent to hit Iran in the near future where the estimates of death are a million Iranians initially, with as many as 35 million collateral who are going to be contaminated with radioactive material and suffer cancer in Pakistan, India, and Afghanistan. So, you know, the question becomes whether a kind of ir ir irrational ideology, if I may characterize it that way broadly for, an anal for analytical purposes, is going to override our capacity to analyze and root our beliefs and evidence and logic. And while it's uh, unquestionably the case that, that uh, you know, Appalachian fundamentalists are uh, evincing a psychological phenomenon, uh, uh, when we talk about or seek to analyze the problem, you cannot dispense with uh, logic and science. And therefore, you know, I think if we're to work our way toward a solution, we have to find a way of elevating the intellectual capacities of the population so that they have a more clear understanding of, of the relationship between beliefs and actions and that when you have beliefs that are un, cannot be shown to be true or false that aren't even empirically testable that you ought to be very reluctant to act on those given the seriousness of the consequences that can result. Could I, could I respond to that as well? Is that possible? Oh, did you want to respond? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. It's okay. Go ahead. Just, 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 just pass it. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, uh, I mean, I 100% agree with you. Actually, I mentioned yesterday that I work with this Wheels of Justice bus tour on a practical level. Kathy Kelly actually was the co-founder of this uh, bus tour. And we speak at dozens, hundreds of churches. We actually spoke at over 200 churches just in the past three, four years. And there are many groups that are reaching out to the Christian community, for example, in the U.S. And, and this is very, very critical because that's an organized community that you could mobilize. And it's also a community that can donate money to our causes. So I agree with you 100% that the, the left movement has really done itself a big disservice by kind of conceding that side and saying that we – we cannot reach. Uh, I know we can reach those folks because we have reached them. We, in Connecticut, the group I'm associated with, most of its donations come from very religious people, and including people who are very, very conservative and so forth. And, and that's where, where we can get our resources and our support and our communities. There is a group called Sabil, which is an ecumenical uh, theological group uh, in the U.S. that holds uh, regional meetings, and at the regional meetings, thousands of people attend. You know, here we have 200 people, maybe 150 people, and half of us are speakers, you know. When you, <laughs> when you get, uh, that's what, we, you need the people. We need to reach to the, beyond the choir, so to speak, and that's the way we do it. I'd, I'd just like to say briefly that I think the best we can do, I think we, the best we can do is to the best we can do is to get out of our damn comfort zones because we have a tendency to get addicted to our own belief systems the same way. And if we don't examine ourselves and say, I'm addicted to my own leftist ideology and how is this not applicable in my life and the life of the world in ways, then we're never going to understand people whose, whose belief systems has become antiquated and no longer works in the world. Lastly, I'd like to say is, you know, Huxley towards the end of his life was asked, what do we do to make a better world? And as an old man on the lecture circuit, the best he could say is just be a little nicer to each other. <laughs> I just want to add one brief further thought, which is that uh, if we can recruit those who have fundamentalistic beliefs to do the right thing, people often do the right thing for the wrong reason, that could obviously be of great benefit. And I would suggest here would be emphasizing the the ethics of the Jesus of the New Testament rather than the vengeance of the God of the Old. Yeah, um, yeah regarding the, the comment made from the floor, um, I think people panic when their model of the world can't tell them how they can operate in the world. And so if it's inadequate, you can be thrown into an infantile state where your model suddenly you realize isn't adequate for dealing with the situation. Right now, the United States, I mean, I think people see all sorts of signs in it, is going down. And William Bloom's presentation, which many of you may have attended earlier today, um, you know, just documented all that. Um, and so, you know, we're headed for a situation where there will be a massive economic reversal in this country. Uh, it's already happening. And uh, the U.S. is losing its dominance as, as, as a world empire. And it doesn't have the constructive capability to replace that. So if people are terrified and they don't know what to do and they're in an alienated state because they've been placed in that state um, by their circumstances, like being thrown off the land, um, separated from the world they know, put into a city situation, you know, working in a factory, totally alienating, totally stupid work uh, that brings the intelligence out of labor, um, then they panic. Uh, and so the rapture, I think, serves as an end point for that panic. It, it says, well, no matter what happens, it's all going to come down to this. And so it just takes that gaping hole in our ability to cope and closes it off. That's, that's the end point. And I think that's maybe the reason for the attachment to it. And when you start thinking about solving things, the person isn't there yet. They don't know. They don't have a vision of how you can really solve the whole thing. But the concept that you might try to address it creates panic because it challenges that rapture, takes away that capping of the panic, um, you know, and, and you're opening up that whole vast infantile fear. So. As a I, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't see you. Yes. 
as a Christian who believes in the transformative power of Jesus' kingdom of God message, I agree wholeheartedly with the question, and I think that the best way to find common ground, at least that I've discovered in my discourses with people, is to show that belief in Armageddon contradicts some of their most fundamental assumptions. For example, the resurrection of Jesus. The belief in Armageddon is completely incompatible with the idea of resurrection from the dead. The earliest Christians and their Jewish forebears did not believe in simply the immortality of the soul. Their idea was for a generalized resurrection which would take place in this space-time universe where the physical corpses of the dead would be restored to life and ultimately God would take up residence here on this planet and bring all things to fruition. And we find in the New Testament that Jesus' resurrection is always described as the first fruits of the general resurrection. This is why the Christians in the first, second, third, and fourth centuries prior to the church-state alliance lived as if their actions were tremendously ethically important because they saw them contributing to the ultimate good of this universe. They saw working for social justice and striving for causes of nonviolence to be of ultimate importance because in the end, there would be this ultimate renovation of all creation, which would show that these actions weren't just meaningless gestures. So a good place to go would be someplace like 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul is chastising the Corinthians who do not want to believe in their own general resurrection. They want to think that once they die, it's just going to be the immortality of the soul, which will escape to heaven and they won't have to put up with this world's problems. And Paul says, no, if the dead in general are not resurrected, then not even Jesus himself was resurrected. Tertullian and Clement in the second century famously said, and I sometimes use this in my classes to shock my students, we are not the heretics who believe that after someone dies, the person just goes to heaven and that's the end of them. Rather, we believe in the resurrection of the flesh, which means that everything we do in the body, in life, is ultimately significant. Then second, I would simply point out that belief in the rapture and Armageddon contradicts the infallibility of the Bible itself. Turn them to the Olivet Discourse in Matthew, Mark, and Luke and show that Jesus explicitly says that his disciples will be in the midst of all of this trouble and persecution. And then take them to texts like 1 Thessalonians 4, which are typically spuriously cited to support the rapture, and show that 1 Thessalonians 4 is talking about exactly the same thing as Jesus is. There's simply no biblical support for the idea. And I think the, the issue that I kind of question is this whole idea of fundamentalism as a problem in the sense that religion is basically irrational and it's belief that you believe is true. So, you, you know, with truth is what you believe. And uh, so, you know, um, any religion, whether it's fundamentalist or mainstream or whatever or out there kind of one, whatever is going to have its beliefs that are believed to be true. Like and and the immoralities that in, that religion kind of bring out are for instance when you were talking about abortion. It's you know, oh abortion is so horrible it's killing an unborn child. On the other hand, killing born children doesn't seem to be a problem yeah. for these people. I don't understand that. Um, so, uh, the issue of, say, for instance, the Jewish fundamentalists that are um, that are really hardcore. Some of them believe that there should not be a state of Israel. I, I think it's Nerir Karad or something. They say uh, only God can restore the state of Israel. So they call Israel the so-called state of Israel. So fundamentalism is kind of a broad. Uh, terminology, but I think religion is uh, kind of the issue too, just general religion and also bringing up, as you said, putting a little morality in religion, you know, the, the need for peace, the need for justice.
responders? Well, I guess since I had the microphone out. <laughs> yeah, then I need to stand again. Um, at the height of the terror in France, when reason had its day, when Voltaire's way came about, on the very day at the height of the use of the guillotine, at the very height of the day of the use of the guillotine, a goddess of reason was put in Notre Dame. Now, what does that tell us about reason? Reason is just another god we believe in. One of us, see, and I think the problem we're dealing with here is monotheism, is the belief in the one god, the one belief system, not the many belief systems, a pantheistic way of looking at the world. I'm not talking about literal. I'm not talking about literally Dionysus rising from the grave. I'm talking about the, the imagination here where we are able to look at both reason, like for example in Greek belief, inside the pantheon of Dionysus was also Apollo, the god of reason, but they never occupied the temple at the same time. And so it, that's, we, that's the clash we always hear between our heart and our head. And so when we, we speak, we have to realize most of the time we're speaking, even when we're being utterly rational, we are speaking from monotheism, that we have to give the irrational a little wiggle room. And the more that we give it a little wiggle room, the less it becomes concretized and rises in a host of stacked bodies. You're, of course, uh, correct that there are multiple forms of fundamentalism, uh, Christian fundamentalism, Jewish fundamentalism, Islamic fundamentalism. So the problem is actually even broader than religion because it really concerns acting on beliefs for which you are not justified, beliefs that may be in principle and capable of being shown to be true or shown to be false. This gives one the entitlement to believe anything they want willy-nilly, which is why the ethics of belief is so profound in its implication. It says that those beliefs that you're incapable of justifying are not ones you're entitled to have. They're immoral beliefs, and you ought not to act on them. And if we could endorse that belief and apply that principle and apply it even to morality, then we would all be obligated to treat one another in accordance with the principles of deontological ethics, to wit, always as valuable as ends in and of ourselves and never merely as means and I can assure you that would have the most radical effects on human interaction that are conceivable to the human mind. I'm Ken Clefman from uh, Kentucky. It's good to be here with everyone. Uh, by way of show of hands, how many have read the book, A Letter to a Christian Nation by Sam Harris? A small number. It's a marvelous book. He addresses this problem head on. I suggest that everyone here take a couple of hours, find it somewhere at Barnes and Noble or some other, or your local library. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. I'm sure that you've read it. Have you not? Actually, Harris, this is the same Harris who has the larger book about the, on faith. Yes, yeah. yeah. Sam Harris, A Letter to a Christian Nation. It's a wonderful book, a couple of hours, a couple of hours. But uh, I think it's clear to everybody here that perhaps the single best uh, recruiting phenomenon happening across the world is the proliferation of our military bases across the country. I'm talking about recruitment for uh, the Nation of Islam wherever they may be, and until we recognize what our military bases are doing in, in terms of helping Islam and the, particularly the radical Islamists, obviously we're going to have to find some way to live in harmony with them, to coexist with them. We need to find a way to scale back our military operations somehow. We have to live at, at peace with Islam. I don't know what it will take for we Americans to accept that. But I think if you read the book, A Letter to a, a, a Christian Nation, it will help gain some insight into that. And it's so good to be here with you people in Virginia. Thank you very much. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Laura George, and I am the director of a charitable educational center called the Oracle Institute. Um, we publish materials specifically geared to fundamentalists, and we're working on this issue night and day as hard as we can. In our keynote uh, address last night, the, the word revolution came up. And I personally believe that the key to this revolution is religion slash spirituality. It is how the Bush administration has gotten away with their deceitful and evil acts is by getting a collection of Christian fundamentalists behind them. Uh, the, leader, the leaders of the movement, by the way, I think absolutely know what they're doing and are corrupt as well. But the masses are enmeshed in a mythical belief system that is not going to change in the near future. Logic is not going to work. All three Abrahamic religions right now are vibrating end times. The New Age movement, by the way, is vibrating end times as well. They have a reverse rapture. It's not the fundamentalist Christians who are going to go up. It's the New Agers. We are living in terrifying times. If you believe it all in the law of attraction, this planet wants to die. It is dying. And it is dying. No one here has mentioned, well, Jesus is a key. We need, we need to put Jesus in historical perspective and emulate and worship his life, not his death. And that's a message that they do get. They understand that his three years of ministering were very, very important, but that message has been lost because of the atonement issue that you speak of, glorifying that horrific martyrdom. That is not why he came here. So that's one key. But the second key that we haven't talked about and no one has mentioned is the resurgence of the feminine aspect of God, which has been lost when God went male about 2,000 years ago. This is a recent phenomenon. We discussed it in our, our first book. This is called The Truth About the Five Primary Religions. I don't know if you can see the cover, but the, sub, the cover shows the scale of justice. And what's going on here is that masculine energy is overweighting feminine energy. On this planet, <coughs> deity was female for about 20,000 years. Then we went into about a 4,000-year period of polytheism. Only one of those religions has survived to this day, really, and that's Hinduism. And that's the first religion we deal with in this book. And then, about 2,000 years ago, we went back to monotheism and God went male. And we started worshiping only one half of God's energy. And when you use their vocabulary, they do listen. They get it. They really do listen. And the doctor, uh, whose mother was Jewish and father was Iraq, she, she did. She goes, let's do the math. Half of the world's female, half the world's male. Let's add in the kids. This revolution is not going to happen unless we deal with fundamentalism and we deal with something that they do get, which is the spiritual component that was lost 2,000 years ago. Call it what you will, the sacred feminine, the Holy Ghost, Isis, whatever name you want to use, that is the key, my friends, to this revolution. And, and I'm very sad that there's only one session here in the next three days on religion because I absolutely believe it's the key. They will not shift. They will not shift if we try and reason them out of it. It's not going to happen. The Pentagon, construction on the Pentagon was September 11th, our Pentagon. And I can't remember the year, but I, I, I was researching this the other day. That, that date is so frequently significant. So anyway, I guess this was more a speech than a question, but my question to you is, what about this, this notion of the other half of God's energy? I think the question is excellent because one thing that people who read the Bible often lack is a cognizance of how many times feminine imagery is used of God. And that's especially true in the Hebrew Bible, where God is described as a mother. God is described as caring for her children. God is the one who is the nurturer. It's also very interesting that the term, the Hebrew term in Genesis chapter 2, which is used for Eve when God says, let us make Adam a helper, 
that word helper is not a derogatory term or trying to indicate submissiveness at all. The only other person or being that word is used of throughout the Hebrew Bible is God. Now, I think it also is helpful to illustrate how Jesus uses feminine imagery to depict God. Jesus talks about his life and his career as trying to, just like the mother hen, to bring her chicks underneath her wings. The idea is of a barnyard fire where the hen brings the chicks under the wings so that even if the mother is extinguished, nevertheless, the hens are safe and sound. And I think a final point would be to illustrate that the language used in the doctrine of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is not meant to indicate gender of any of the persons. And the reason why is simply because if human beings are created in the imago dei, in the image of God, then God is beyond gender. And God is beyond other dualities which human beings typically try to construct for him. I mean, uh, <clears throat> the issue of religion, I mean, we can spend uh, years arguing about religions and religious uh, ideologies and so forth. But if you read Joseph Campbell, which kind of analyzes the roots of religions and the mythologies and how these things relate to each other, you find that there are basic concepts that are shared of all religions. The one I like most, and this is personal, you can choose whatever you want to, but the one I like most about commonality of religions is that they all speak about not doing to others what you don't want done to you. And that's the commonality that we have to talk about. We should, we should not waste a lot of time talking about whether Christianity or Islam has the right characteristic or whatever. And when, once you do that, by the way, you start to understand the commonality and emphasize the commonality instead of emphasizing the differences. When I was growing up, we, on Ramadan, we used to consider it a holiday, even though my family is Christian. And the Muslims in Bethlehem used to come to Christmas, you know, celebrations. It is, it, it's all of these traditions and, and the formalities are really not the essence of what religion is about. I, I think with fondness about pa, uh, Robert Patterson, uh, uh, Robert, well, Robertson, what, what he said. He said, Muslims do not worship God, they worship Allah. The, the moon god. And I was like, does this, I mean, do people really study things? What is Allah? Allah is the Arabic word for God. Christian Arabs and Muslim and Jewish Arabs and Muslim Arabs, they call, all refer to God as Allah. Allah, by the way, is from the root El, which is the Elohim, which is the highest God. That's where it comes from. And it's the commonality of that, the highest, the highest being, whatever it is, you want to call it in different languages. That's the commonality we have to think about. Let's stop this nonsense about arguing about, and, and uh, with all due respect to the previous speaker, making peace with Islam and stuff like that. You know, one and a half billion Muslims in the world are there. You know, I don't want to make peace with Islam. You know, I want to make peace with humanity, you know. And the people who are opposed to, opposed to humanity are our common enemies. Those are the people like George Bush, like Pat Robertson, like Jerry Falwell, like Osama bin Laden, whatever you want to call them. They are not really the people that we consider our fellow human beings who are struggling for the same principles that you and I struggle for. And so that's what we need to be talking about. All I would add to that is um, I agree with what Mazin said earlier in his presentation. I think you were implying this anyway, that religions tend to follow the uh, dominance hierarchy rather than the other way around. You know, that the, polit that the political impetus precedes the religious rationalization Right. Exactly. Right. I agree with that. And and so in answer to the questioner um, regarding uh, you know why is it that patriarchy is so prevalent in today's religions? I think you just have to look at the world. The world is run as a top-down hierarchy right now. I mean, th it's so dominant. And um, and women uh, have always been associated with the community. Um, cooperation and diversity, building up the real fabric of life. Uh, and that's why domestic labor isn't acknowledged, because the control system says, oh, we did all this. You know, oh, you may have raised this child from birth. Yes, but we're the ones who recruited the child as a soldier. 
took the child out and got real wealth from this other country, how else would you get oil in your vehicle? So, uh, you know, with that kind of a, a world surrounding religion, is it any wonder that patriarchy rather than a matriarchal uh, religious uh, paradigm is, is dominant? Very quickly, I think what you said about authority is important, both of the matriarchal and patriarchal. Very ironically, I saw a bumper sticker one time. It had a picture of the earth that said, love your mother. Next to it, it said, question authority. Somehow paradox was lost there. <laughs> session isn't until 2 o'clock, if we, if we want to skip lunch. So we have time for, I think, two more, if we can keep our comments fairly brief. Uh, you, you have a question, right? Uh, I'll okay, we, then this will be our last question. My name is Rex Green. Uh, I'm really looking forward to dialogues like this throughout the conference. I think they're just as important as the presentations. Uh, with, no, with all respect to the presenters who are all very knowledgeable, uh, I think this has been a great session. Uh, I don't agree with anybody, uh, but <laughs> <laughs> nevertheless, I, I'm here to tell you one more thing. Uh, I don't know how many of you have read Ken Wilber's works, but I highly recommend them. Yeah. Uh, what we have to do is build a larger perspective within our own minds. Uh, we tackled the uh, scientific and the religious today, those are like two sides of his uh, four-way quadrant. And I'm so glad that uh, Philip here talked about knowing the people and understanding what people are feeling because that's very important in Wilbur's uh, scheme of things. And the academics deal with the, the rational. Uh, we need to deal with all these things. Uh, what we're not dealing with is the developmental aspect of human beings. And Every one of us starts as that fetus, and if we survive the non-abortion, uh, we become <clears throat> little tyrants. <laughs> and terrible twos are hard on parents. I have two kids, I know. Uh, we go through these stages, but we don't think about them because in each stage of our development, we are what we are, and we don't, we're not programmed to think about it. So. What Wilbur has done is try to pull together all the developmental uh, theories and synthesize them. And other people have done the same. And what you'll see when you have people who are so adamant about beliefs that are not justified is that they are at a lower stage of development than you are. And this is natural. It's not unnatural. And so this advice about be people with them and not be parents, not try to tell them what to do, is very important. Now, my own experience is with my brother who wanted me to listen to Rush Limbaugh. Now that's, that's like assigning me to sit on a chair like my mother did when I was bad. It's like torture, pure torture. But I did it, okay? And I listened to one of his programs. And I could spot all the irrationality in it all the propaganda styling, the uh, <clears throat> clamoring for your feeling rather than your thinking. And then I said, okay, am I going to talk to my brother about this? No. He's a truck driver. He listens to Rush Limbaugh on the road. Rush keeps him going. <laughs> I can't tell him. This is crazy. He loves it. So. I was thinking this session would help me figure out what to tell my brother. <laughs> and then he's just simply in a different developmental stage than I am. But I am trying so hard to be a person with him. He's going through a divorce and he needs me. So I'm just trying to be there for him. And I say that's my best advice. but. I'd be interested in any of the panelists commenting on this developmental aspect and how to deal with it. Any comments on? Since I, since I have the, um, the microphone, I guess, yes, of course, the infantile omnipotence question comes into it when we're talking about infantile personalities. You can sort of see George Bush seeing the Oval Office as a high chair and throwing these tantrums of mouse destruction. 
Of course, I mean, the magical thinking aspect of the world before us, we can't control. It's this overwhelming, overpowering thing. Your brother spends all day looking at an ugly interstate. The last thing I'd want to listen to is that ugly man. So I think when I, for example, when I was growing up, my family moved from Birmingham, Alabama, when I was a teenager to Atlanta, Georgia. Big city. It was a bigger city. And I remember having experiences that were closer to religion as the last of the 1960s started filtering in to the suburbs, where I, going down and seeing the Almond Brothers, for example. That was religiosity. That synthesis of Delta Blues, a little bit of Coltrane jazz improvisation, not to mention the mind altering circumstances that we found ourselves in. <laughs> That was a life changer to me that was close to a spiritual epiphany. And I really think if you look at the, some of the changes that are happening in South and Central America, they're a reaction to colonialism. They're a reaction to imperialism. And a lot of things that are happening in the churches there are because of ritual sacraments like ayahuasca, um, the vine of God that connects people with that experience again of a sort of an earth consciousness. So to find an aspect of commonality, whether it be music, whether it be creativity, find what it is that your brother lives larger within himself involves. There's that Wallace Stevens poem with all the terrible imagery about death and conflicted feelings, and the last line of it goes, but there was a man within me that could have stood up sharply into the sky. That's find that part of where your brother is where he used to live in his yearning, and then approach him from there. I hope that was just some help. Um, I agree fully, and I would say that's where we start to all people. We start where they are, and we, we help them if we can. If we have something to contribute, we help them along the way to understanding, to greater understanding what's going on. And sometimes taking their own understanding and showing them the contradictions within their own understandings is the best way to move them in that direction. I mean, I, for myself, I, I have seen it happen over and over again with people who were even extreme Zionists, who turned anti-Zionist. Within a few weeks of discussions, it, it happens. It's very easy, and, and it's not, I mean, it's not easy, but it's, it's doable, and, and we just have to, to take that road. It, it, it takes some effort on our part to educate ourselves about their position, which is what I like about what was said here, is that first of all, we, we have to have the humility to understand that we don't have all the answers and that I could be wrong and that I should learn about these other things and not just assume that you're either with me or against me. We know who says that. It's not ours, you know. <laughs> We really have to do that. We have to get down to that level. I encourage you to read. I have a quote in my book uh, by Joseph Campbell about this issue of dogmatism and, and, how, and how you can move to the center ground and that way you can bring people together. And, and I think that's where we need to be moving. Um, and I, I encourage you. I mean, Kathy Kelly wrote a wonderful book that, that brings those kinds of ideas, those kinds of thinkings together. We really have to start thinking along those lines. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all very much. I thought every single presentation was wonderful, just excellent. And thank you all for coming, too. Uh, see you later today.